Freedom is not a gift bestowed upon us by other men, but a right that belongs to us by the laws of God and nature. Benjamin Franklin You're now listening to Carolina Conservative. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for your service. Obviously, you guys give of yourselves to, to do what you're doing. The community, I think we recognize that now that the political juice has been sucked out of the mask distraction, that we have to move forward. And one of the things I wanted to thank you for tonight was the resolution, the non-discrimination resolution, the CRT deal, because it's, it's happening. And as a parent, I speak to other parents, there's a few things that we don't want. I'm biracial, I'm bilingual, I'm multicultural. The fact is in America, in North Carolina, I can do anything I want. And I teach that to my children. And the person who tells my little pecan color kids that they're somehow oppressed based on the color of their skin would be absolutely wrong and absolutely at war with me. And I think that's the same for every parent. What the mask showed us is that the parents, the most powerful group of people in our country, that they're taking back the wheel. Now, obviously, we had to take the wheel back for the mask, but we're taking the wheel back from Washington all the way to Raleigh and into our local school board because CRT, all of that... The parents don't want it. It's a big fat lie. There's not one. If if you believe in CRT, I want to tell you you're a liar because that means you look at your black neighbor and say that they're oppressed. And you look at your white neighbor and say that they're evil, regardless of the experience that you've had with them. And we're not going to do that. The parents in the United States of America right here in North Carolina and Cabarrus County, we know that's not true because we believe the lives we live. The fact is, I've been a business owner right here in North Carolina, and I deal with white people, black people, Hispanic people. My children deal with everybody. And the racism is only happening at the government level and on the media. The fact is, you have racists, and there's like, you can't even find them hardly. You just hear the stories about them. But this is is what we're dealing with. The parents are taking the wheel. I have an eight-year-old daughter who is absolutely dynamic, who can do anything athletically, intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally. She is a dynamo. And I don't want a man swimming against her in the pool. The fact is, I don't want her playing against boys in soccer. I don't even let my sons rough her up. Do you think I'm going to let your son rough her up? This is what we're talking about. Policy going back to the parents. Because if you think people who love America are willing to fight for it, you haven't met parents yet. Because I'm telling you, parents will go further down any street than anyone who loves their country alone. My name is Brian Echeverria. I thank you for your service, and we're taking back the wheel. Brian Echeverria is with me today. Brian's running for NC House in District 73. That represents the Cabarrus County area. Brian, thank you for being on Carolina Conservative. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. <laughs> well, th- yeah, thank you a lot for uh, for being on with me. Um, now, I don't know if everybody knows who you are, but uh, for me, you hit the scene, and for I think for most people, you hit the scene. Uh, you went viral for a speech at the Board of Education in February, I guess, uh, in Cabarrus County, and you spoke about the evils of of CRT and what yes, we've sir. seen with transgender athletes competing in women's athletics, and uh, ah. I. I must say, uh, yeah, very pertinent to uh, the last week. I must say that that speech was brilliant. Um, and uh, I think that sometimes we assume that everyone knows what CRT is, but uh, I don't think that really is the case. So can you give us a quick rundown of, of what CRT is and why parents should really be worried about it? Um, I think to, to, number one, thank you for the introduction. You know, the dude came in last in the 100 uh, meter in the swimming right you throw a race much <laughs> right right all of a sudden he's no good yeah, yeah. <laughs> the um but i think to talk about crt it's important to understand what is not okay what they bill it as is simply a more inclusive history you know where they talk about the atrocities that did happen 
And that's the reason we have so much fight from parents who don't really understand this because they think it's just a matter of telling the story of things that happened, except that's not critical race theory, that's history. And history is out there. We know about things like Rosewood and we know that slavery happened and the atrocities that went on there. That's not CRT. Mm -hmm. CRT actually comes out of Marxism. And I know that's one of the, the, the left's catchwords that we say everything is Marxist. But Karl Marx had something called conflict theory. And it was the idea that there were different races and there were different social economic groups that were contending for limited resources like food, water, entertainment. And that if you can get them to turn on one another, number one, you can crush the middle class and you can crush Christianity. If you crush the middle class, the bourgeois, as they call them, right? If you crush them, then you crush capitalism. So CRT was uh, originally conflict theory turned into conflict law theory, where you hear people say it's taught in graduate studies. And then it became uh, critical race theory, critical race theory, right? So you have that progression from conflict theory, critical law theory, critical race theory. And it's teaching that we're innately something and that can be judged based on the color of our skin. Matt is literally the antithesis of the Dr. King dream. Right. You know, now apparently you're evil because you're white. I'm inferior and oppressed because I'm black, right? So that's what it's teaching. So it's not that our character gets to determine things anymore. It's that our color determines our character. And the end game is conflict in order to crush the middle class, crush capitalism, destroy Christianity. Right. And you're right. If if you teach, whether it's if you're teaching black children or or Hispanic children or whoever that that they're a victim for yes. for, you know, you know, as long as the state has a as a hold of them while they're in school, if you teach them there every year from from five to 18, they're going to be a victim. If you well, teach a, a white kid that he's an oppressor and he's evil then he's going to have some mental issues uh, by the time he's hit his teen years. You know, it's, I, I don't know. I, and listening to your speech, I mean, you were talking about your daughter, like she can do anything and be anything that she wants to be. There's nothing that's holding her back and you can't tell her that there is. That literally, there's nothing holding her back. Yeah. This is literally, not figuratively, not right. in my sentiments and feelings. Right. The greatest nation on earth by every measure this is the only place you really want to be a minority. Yeah. You know, and we have equal opportunity. It took some time, like every nation to become what it is, mm -hmm. but it's 2022 and we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, right? So this is 22, 2022 America and that's actually an accurate depiction of our daily life. Yeah. And America is not perfect. No, no, but, but nobody's trying to claim it is. And, no. but what they're, like you mentioned, the 1619 project, that's just, I mean, that's basically a novel. Yeah. And it's you know not, what? And she America, admits it. <laughs> we can write fiction. I mean, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's anything to make it look worse so that imagine this, Matt, in 20 years, you have a high schooler today who's 18, so he's 38, or she's 38 in 20 years. She's a doctor, she's a government employee, okay? It doesn't matter if he's black, white, or Hispanic, but he looks at you in 20 years and he's making decisions about your life, whether that's healthcare, retirement, or liberty. But when he looks at you, he thinks this man is evil. Or he looks at me and thinks maybe we don't really need to waste resources on him because he's inferior. Mm -hmm. So what we're not seeing, this isn't just a, a battle for parental rights of the moment. This is literally a battle for those who will lead our nation and our businesses in the future and how they're going to see things. Because the heart of a child doesn't have a filter. It's only a seedbed. Mm -hmm. So whatever you put in gets nurtured and grows. It's not like speaking to a 25-year-old grad student who he's saying, nah, I reject that. I take that. I like that. I don't know what I think about that. This is the heart of a child. You just put it in there and let it grow. They begin to form their opinions and their worldview based on the seeds that have been placed in their heart. They have literally been plotting the attack on our families 
for decades. And the hearts of the children is, is the place that they can win our nation because later on, it won't take a war. It's gonna take a bunch of indoctrinated people to vote against our liberty, to vote against our way of life. So they're going after the children. Yeah, and you mentioned it, you know, looking 20 years down the road, what it's going to look like. We've seen it now with healthcare, um, whether it's um, COVID, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're treating more equity now than equality, you know, an equity of outcomes. So with COVID, like with vaccines, they were working on trying to get um, vaccines to different populations based on the color of their skin. You still there? Yeah, I lost you okay. for a second. Okay. okay. So with the, the the equity, go ahead. Yeah, we were. I was talking about um, what you mentioned with uh, with looking twenty years down the road. Now they're teaching equity, and we've already seen it with COVID. Trying to get the vaccine to different populations based on the color of their skin more so than who really needed it. Whether which, you know, they should have been looking at age more than anything, but uh, yeah. Which freaks me out. Okay, it's yeah. amazing. So. As a black man, I know about things like the Tuskegee Project. Right. Please don't send me a racially uh, designated box of vaccines. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. And that's, you know, talking to talking to minorities and, you know, looking at statistics, minorities have been more vaccine hesitant. Can you blame them? I, I can't. <laughs> if you exactly. look at history. But, you're, but then you're, the, the problem is, Matt, the minorities also tend to vote for the socialists or the Democrats. Right. Now, this is what's interesting. So here we are, we're conservatives. I'm a Christian, okay? So my social views are, are, are literally bolted to the word of God, okay? And I'm a financial advisor. So my fiscal views are a balanced <laughs> budget and, yeah. and you need more income than outflow, right? Outflow, you need that cash flow to be positive. Right. So what happens is the typical minority family here in North Carolina, let's just give a broad statistic, Entrepreneurship, small business ownership is at an all time high in every community. What that tells you, whether you're black, you're white, you're Hispanic, is we live in a state where people believe in free enterprise. Except in November, a lot of those people will go and vote for the people who don't want them to have free enterprise, who want to overregulate them, give them fees to the hilt. Here in Cabarrus County, we actually had a uh, 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 sandwich board rule where you could not put the sandwich board more than 10 feet from the entrance of your door without a permit you get it <laughs> you couldn't do it like, yeah. do i need a permit to put a sign more than 10 feet from the entrance of my business so this was a real deal so these are the people who they'll later go vote in office, but at the same time, they're trying to build a small business mm -hmm. that they can pass on to their children or at least teach their children the principles and the disciplines of entrepreneurship. So they're literally voting against themselves, but that's because us, let's take the blame, conservatives, we've done a horrible job messaging, telling them that we say words like free enterprise mm -hmm. instead of saying, hey, who here owns a business? And then Everybody raised their hand. Who here would like to own a business? Who here has an idea for a business? Who would love to give that business to your children? Everybody raises their hand. Then we say, oh, great. So now what that's called is free enterprise. But we don't say that. No, no. You We're know, just... we say things like big government. Well, what's big government? I just finished doing a video. Big government is when the legislature actually has a conversation about oversight of your homeschool. <laughs> Like, what yeah. are you talking about at your kitchen table? Right. Yeah. Right. But we say big government. Instead of saying, do you want to report to the government what you teach your children at home? Or would you, you like the like government that? to lift these regulations so it makes it easier for you to start your business and become exactly. more profitable? Yeah, we, we don't. You're right. We don't do a good job of messaging. Uh, we don't. I, I think I'm hoping that's getting better, especially with this election. Um, you see a different type of candidate, including you, um, that it's not your typical 60 year old um, candidate that's running for government that you know, young people can't relate to and, and minorities can't relate to. Um, so I think we're getting a different kind of candidate uh, and more of a 
people who are going to go there and actually make a difference than whether it's going to Raleigh or going to Washington or whatever, instead of just going along to get along and, oh, yeah. I'm a senator, you know, uh, let me yeah. let me see how much I can grift off of this. Well, you know, this is this is what I figured over the last two months, because I'm new to this. So, you know, I announced my candidacy on January 4th. I had the miracle of the viral video. Mm -hmm. That was an absolute miracle. I wish I knew how to do it. I'd be viral. Next <laughs> week, right. But what I what I learned is at 44 years old, everything about government touches my life. I have my my parents are retired veterans, 25 mm -hmm. and 30 years. I have a wife who I promised to take care of. And we have to move towards retirement. Mm -hmm. I have children who I want to have a great future. And I have a small business here in our community. So every regulation touches my life in some, in some way. And I learned that what the socialists would like is people in government who don't have skin in the game. And we need people in government who are affected by their own legislation. Absolutely. A government, what? For, for the, the people, people, of the people, for the people, mm -hmm. right? So what we have is a government with too many people insulated from the decisions they make for us. So I'm, I'm, I would love to say I'm extraordinary, but I think I'm actually extraordinary. I'm just like my neighbors. Mm -hmm. I love my family. I love this nation. I want them to have a great future. And I believe my life. Here we are. You're white. I'm black, biracial, whatever. You know, mm -hmm. I get disowned when I talk about how great America <laughs> is. <laughs> you know yeah so it's like it's, it's kind of crazy but the uh uh and we live in a society where our children play together we go to work together we shop together we watch sports together we do rec together but when you turn on the news inevitably there's someone lying about the tension the racial tensions in america right and, and i step outside of my front door and i'm like where is it right you know there's i don't think america is racist we we have racist. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. But America is not pedophile either. We have pedophiles. Right. Right. And so I don't encounter racism on a regular basis at all. I spoke to someone the other day. She's a, a, a real estate broker here. No, she's a financial advisor. I'll tell you about the real estate broker in a second. She's a financial advisor. She said, I've been a financial advisor for 20 years. I've encountered racism maybe two times. Mm hmm. 20 years right here. But if you turn on the news, apparently she's experiencing what they call microaggressions, you on know, a daily on, basis on a daily basis. And, and, you know, it's, it's Matt, sometimes people just don't like you. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, because I don't like Barack Obama. It has nothing to do with this race. It has everything yes. to do with this politics. Uh, and, yeah. Maybe, it, maybe it has something to do with his assault on our, on our homes and the sanctity right. of marriage and, the stance on abortion, maybe it has a lot more to do than just with his cult. Right, right. And, um, you know, you mentioned before, um, I was going to go somewhere with Obamacare, um, the, the, the overreach, the overreach of, of government in every single decision you make in your life. And that's one of the good examples of they're in there now. Yes, and it's going to be hard to fight back and push back on they're in every healthcare decision you make now. That's, it's massive. I um I remember when they started keeping the electronic records. Yeah. You know, before it was a sheet of paper, you had a folder. If you needed a copy, you had to go there and get it. Right. Now it's electronic. I'm sure it's being injected into some database. We have the greatest uh, pediatrician. I have no complaints, but he also respects me as their father. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I walk in and I'm like, hey, you know what? My son, he's, uh, he's 12 now. We're going to stop giving him the testicle test. Mm hmm you know, and, and he's like, well, okay, well, if he has a hernia, then we're not going to know. I said, well, if it starts hurting, we'll bring him back. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But you know, and, and he, and he totally respects that. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm a slow vaxxer. Yes. Let's not give him all the shots at eight pounds, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. my children are, are, are vaccinated, but we didn't do, we did that over a long stretch of time. But what they do is they want to tell us that the freedom to make decisions makes us anti-science. Right. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, when you talk about healthcare, we could, what about the mask, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, as conservatives, we tend to get off message. We start arguing the, the virtue of the science. 
oh, they're not effective. Well, that's not my debate. Yeah. My debate is if they were 100% effective, you still can't make me wear it. Right. It's about freedom. My debate on the shot, if it was 100% effective at minimizing the symptoms and the effect of COVID, you still can't make me get the shot. But we tend to get drawn into this theoretical world and then we get into arguments about science. Well, mm -hmm. this percentage and this doctor said and that doctor and ivermectin and the hydrochloroquine and everything. Well, no, how about freedom? Yeah. How about if I want ivermectin, give it to me. When it truly comes down to the core, it's about freedom. You're right. There, there is science. There is data that shows the masks don't really work. And the, the vaccine is, you know. Marginal at best. Yeah, exactly. Um, dangerous at worst. Uh, yes. But uh, it comes down to freedom. That's the true to message. Yeah, it comes um, down to it. You know, they had here in, in Cabarrus County, we have a coffee shop and we just converted it to a mobile shop. But during COVID, we were there and the health department mandated that our people, our staff wore masks and we had to do certain things in order to be open. And it was really tough for us because here we are, we didn't believe they could make us. Yeah. But we didn't have the money to prove they couldn't, mm -hmm. you know. So what we would do is if somebody comes in and they didn't, excuse me, they didn't have a mask on, we would, they would say, hey, do I have to wear a mask? I'm like, listen, if the state wants to know if you wear a mask or not, they're, they're welcome to put somebody outside and look in. I don't work for the state, which is what they do. They try to turn the citizen against the citizen. Next mm -hmm. thing you know, you have people calling saying that this, this business isn't wearing masks. You know, and, and that's the freedoms that we lost, the freedom to wear that mask or not. We can't win debates with people who are terrified of the virus when we talk about the effectiveness of the mask. But we ended up trying to have that debate. Mm -hmm. we're, I mean, we literally had, we were literally out there trying to help people understand microns. Well, see, 0 0.0293 microns. Right. That's not the issue. The issue is I don't have to, and you can. That's the issue. Yeah. I don't have yeah. to, and you can. Everybody has the freedom to do what they want to do. If, as long it. as you're not hurting someone else, you know, as long as you're not impeding on my freedoms, you, you'd be free to do whatever you want to do. Um, do, what you want to do. And I'm going to do what I want to do. This is America. <laughs> and, and like you said, there's a good example of uh, having citizens report on other citizens, you know, 1984. But um, yes, New York City right now is, is at, they have a tip line set up for citizens to report truck drivers that let their trucks idle for too long. It's so ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> but moving on, uh, we don't have a ton of time today, so I do want to hit some other issues. Um the other thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, because some of your key issues on your platform. So what's what can we do to end abortion in North Carolina? We're, we're lagging, in my opinion, we're lagging behind other states when it comes to this issue. What can we do to to end that in North Carolina? Well, number one, I think we need Roe v. Wade turned over so it can come back to the state. Right. Number we're two, blown. we're going to need a supermajority to get anything done. Mm -hmm. Number three, we're going to need a Republican governor if we don't have a supermajority. And number four, we're going to need a conservative Supreme Court. That's what it's going to be. And then from there, we can pass the laws necessary to end abortion. We're not going to sit back and just keep murdering babies here. If we have the power to end it, we need to end it. Yeah. And then obviously that's going to be a big fight because the, the liberals, number one, they lie to the, to the people. They lie to them. They tell them it's not a baby yet. So they dehumanize our children in the womb and they lie to them. So when people are thinking they're getting an abortion, they're not thinking they're killing a baby. But you and I both know that they're killing a baby, someone who is going to uniquely mark this world, uniquely bless our families and someone who has done nothing to anyone. You know, so I think that's that's what we need. We need to educate, educate, educate. Yeah. Not the legislators the population, the people. And then we need to have the right pieces in government so that when it comes back, we can ban that mess. Because it's, I mean, I myself, I put it on online. When I was a young man, before I was a Christian, before I was anything, you're talking about a teen boy. I followed a child that was aborted. Mm -hmm. And I cried and begged for it not to be. 
she didn't care. And without having a position pro-choice, pro-life, I wasn't thinking about God. I wasn't thinking about any of that. I knew that my baby was being murdered. Mm -hmm. So I tell people I'm pro-life because I'm human. And then after that, I also lost a child. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever lost a child, this was with my, my marriage. We lost mm -hmm. our first child. If you've ever lost a child, you can't imagine someone killing one on purpose. Right. So my convictions about abortion were forged in the fire of life's traumas. Yeah. yeah. The human experience. And it's, you know, it's not just, like you said, it's not, it, it's not just people that grew up, you know, staunch Christians that, that had this abortion stance drilled into their head from, you know, eight years old. It's people that have lived it. Um, you know, it look at Abby Johnson. She's one of the biggest pro-life advocates in the country now. She used to be a director of Planned Parenthood. I mean, so it's, God works in mysterious ways. Uh, so that's something that, that's a big issue for me. I, I hope that we can, we can do something in North Carolina. Let me tell you this. I did a CRT teaching mm -hmm. for someone here. And a gentleman, you know, I was going through some of the things that happened in the past. And he says, well, what about the black babies they fed the alligators? I said, you know, I've heard about a couple of stories like that. But if you're offended about 12 black babies fed to alligators, but you're not offended at Planned Parenthood, there's something wrong in, in, the, in the continuity of your thinking. Yeah. So the minority communities don't see that Planned Parenthood literally puts their, their outposts, their, their strongholds in minority communities to carry yep. out the mission of genocide that it was founded with. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it absolutely disproportionately affects minorities. Yes. Absolutely. I, I think that we ought to, as conservatives, if we get hold of the money, we ought to spend the money to put her quotes in the mailbox of every Black family in America. Yeah. We ought to show how that quote connects to the location of their local Planned Parenthood. And I bet you, because people love their families, we'll see a, a, a tide rise against it and the yeah. narrative change. But we have to spend money educating the deceived. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it's been ingrained in, in people's psyche for, you know, a hundred years now with going back to Margaret Sanger, you know, going back to her, it's, it's, it's been, you know, just progressively, progressively put in, put in our minds that this is, this is for women's rights. It's not, it's not. Um, so one thing uh, else on your platform is about um, religious freedom. And, you know, we saw it with COVID tyranny, churches got shut down or had to alter the way that they chose to worship, whether it was wearing a mask, singing, or, or um, you know, numbers that they could have, you know, the number of people they could have in their service. It wasn't as bad as what we saw in other states like California, but it was still bad. Our rights were infringed upon. What, what do we do in Raleigh to prevent that from happening again? Well, I want to tell you a story. A story, I, I love to watch Shark Week. You like Shark Week? Yeah, yeah. Right. I love Shark Week. They show the same thing every year. I watch uh -huh. it every year. Right. right. And it uh, talks about the great white. The great white shark will come and it bumps its prey. So the first hit is what they call bumping. Mm -hmm. And then if it determines that it's something it wants to consume, it circles back around and it consumes the seal or whatever it is, the prey. And the way I describe what happened during COVID with our churches is we just got bumped. The government bumped us to see what we would be willing to do, who would uh, placate to their authority, right? And I believe that they're planning something or would like to do something far more sinister to limit our religious freedom. So what we need is to end all gentleman agreements between the church and the state. And I don't mean separation of church and state, because I don't, I don't think the Constitution says it that way. It says it that doesn't. the state won't rule over the church right. the way it just did during mandates. Mm -hmm. What I mean is we need legislation that puts rock solid wording that the state will issue no executive order, no government mandate re related to the church. Yeah. We don't wanna leave it to be interpreted what that means. We wanna put it in writing. We wanna get it signed. And guess what? A whole lot of Democrats go to church. Yeah. And a whole lot of pastors haven't been able to get their parishioners back in church. No. The church has definitely gone down. 
and that's we have important. their support. So that's one of the first things we actually need to do to make sure that we have another line of defense against that kind of tyranny. Because I remember, here's a pencil, but uh, a person once told me that wars are actually won and lost with a pen. By the time we start shooting guns, it's already been decided through peace treaties, arms agreements, and all of that, who's going to win the war it just has to be played out. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is make sure that with the pen, we put the law on our side. That will put firewalls up between what they can and can't do, and that's the way we need to, to make it happen. Great, great. I love that answer. Um, real quick, um, tell me about your, your plans for North Carolina income tax gas taxes, pro-business plan, um, but mainly yes, on the tax, but mainly on the taxes. What, what, what are your plans for income tax? We need a zero income tax here and we don't need it in 20 years. I'll be retired in 20 years. Right. <laughs> or nearing retirement, right? Be, 60, be 64 years old. So I'll be retired in 20 years. We need a plan to bring that income tax to zero as soon as possible. Now, North Carolina doesn't have gas and oil resources but neither does Tennessee and they have zero income tax. Mm -hmm. It'll take some fiscal responsibility. We have a vast amount of resources here, but we don't have a great tourism industry. Why can't we attract industries that will inspire tourism? You know, they, people fly into the beautiful Charlotte airport and then they drive across the North Carolina, South Carolina border and they go to Carowinds, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They go stay in hotels down there. Why don't we have a tourism industry that's beyond Concord Mills Mall, right? Obviously we have the Outer Banks, but you don't have a great big airport and you have to drive down little streets. It, it, it can't be nurtured into what it, it should be. Mm -hmm. And so we need to focus on industry, the tourism industry. We need to focus on infrastructure. We need to focus on jobs. And the, and the way I say focus on jobs, meaning bring, bringing big companies here so that we can go ahead and eliminate that income tax. When you talk about things like the gas tax, I mean, North Carolina, you would think that we're situated next to Massachusetts and Rhode Island, the way we're taxed and feed here. Yeah. You know, if, I'm not, if I'm not wrong, it's the, one of the, it's the highest in the South. It is the highest in the South. Yeah. You know, and it shouldn't be that way. No. And I don't know how it got that way. You know, I'm, I'm not a historian in that manner. I'm just a, a I'm your neighbor who's deeply affected by it. Yeah. You know, we're top 10 in the gas tax. Top 10 out of 50 states. Here's North Carolina, 36 point something cents a gallon mm -hmm. to the state. We get fees for everything from signs outside, <laughs> you know, yeah. we, get, we get them for everything. Yeah, we're paying that income tax and then we're still paying all these other taxes. Uh, you know, property tax is one of the biggest ones in my book that kills me. Um, yes. But you yes. live there. Hold, hold on, Matt. Property yeah. tax. You live in a house for 20 years. They raise your taxes every single year. Yeah. And then, boom, one day you're on fixed income. But yeah. your property taxes keep going up on a house you've lived in for 25 years. It's predatory mm -hmm. at best, absolutely evil at worst. But there's nothing good about that. There's no incentive. Our real estate market is off the chain because there's no reason or advantage for people staying in their home. We need a homestead exemption. The homestead exemption will protect the small business owner from losing his primary or her primary residence in the event of a lawsuit. We need a homestead exemption that the tax assessed value is decreased. We incentivize people for staying in their home. They get an exemption of 70,000 or whatever off of their tax assessed value. We need, we need common sense, protect common sense. our citizens type of things. I mean, if you've been in a home for three, three years, two years, let's say, yeah, you should get an exemption. And you need to know if you sell that home, your exemption doesn't follow you to your next home. You have to start at year one. So yeah, there's right. some incentive for a person not to move every two years, three blocks away from his house. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, no, completely. I, I love that idea, the homestead exemption. That's the first time I've heard that. So I'm going to research that a little bit more. Um, is there anything else that you want to know uh, or that you want your potential voters to know before the primary? Uh, I think that as they look, they're going to know that I'm literally the only conservative candidate in our primary race. And the way you know who's conservative is not 
who's conservative or not is not by what they say, but how they live. So here I am, the neighbor, deeply involved in my faith, a financial advisor, understanding that you need to save and that the, the family should not be assaulted by taxes and fees. Same thing with the small business. I used to be a, a concealed carry instructor here. I have a great arsenal, <laughs> which means I live out my Second Amendment rights. So the biggest thing is when we look at a person, whoever it is that we're going to vote for is how do they live their life? Not simply what did they say. We need to know how they live their life and then we can determine if what they say is true. Mm -hmm. And what all of my neighbors will discover is I am the only, the only, I wish I wasn't, but I am the only conservative in my race right now. And it's gonna deeply affect us in the legislature. North Carolina needs conservative vision to shape the future. Absolutely. We don't, we don't need people who are gonna placate who are so reasonable that every little argument tosses them further to the left. And that's what I would like to say. I would like to say that family is our story. Yeah, absolutely. Story absolutely. How can people find out more about you? Uh, definitely go on my website, brianecheveria.com. That's B-R-I-A-N-E-C-H-E-V-A-R-R-I-A.com. And also follow me on social media. Elect Brian Echeverria. Vote for Brian Echeverria. Vote Brian Echeverria. Yep. And I'd love to hear from you. We need lots of help if you're in the area. We're knocking doors. We want to run the most efficient ground campaign that our county has ever seen. We're starting this Saturday to get out there with these doors and knock. And we're sending the mailers. So we're coming in through the air. We're coming in through the ground. And we want to basically get the message out. Great. Um, and we will include all your links on the podcast and we'll share that on Facebook as well. Brian, thank you very much for, for being on Carolina Conservative today and great. Uh, we wish you great luck in the primary. Thank you. All right. Thank you.